Welcome back to Arbor Unboxed. Guess what? It is time for another episode of Unboxing Boxes. So, on the menu today, I think we have some motherboards that we've been waiting quite some time for. We'll start with this box up here because I'm certain this has what we're after because it says B450 Tomahawk. Spoiler alert. So we'll get into that quickly. And they've made this one quite difficult to get into. Okay, now that we've removed all that unnecessary strapping, time to see what is inside. Ooh. Now I think I've got this around the right way. Here we go. Can you believe it? They are finally here. After what's been an unusually long wait, it has to be said, since the second gen Ryzen processors came, they launched with the X470 chipsets, and everyone was left wondering where the B450s were. And then finally, we did see them at Computex, and now it's like, I don't know, two months since Computex, and I finally have one in hand. And you should be able to buy one, I think it's in about a week or two. Anyway, you've probably come here to see what it looks like. We'll get that information out of the way, because that's probably still under NDA. A bit of benchmark numbers and whatnot from MSI. Apart from the motherboard, you get a pair of SATA cables, some cool MSI stickers, CD thing, manual, and an IO shield. So pretty basic stuff, as you'd expect with a, a budget-focused board. So the B450 Tomahawk looks to be quite an impressive a budget sort of motherboard. I believe the uh, B350 Tomahawk was one of the most, if not the most successful uh, B350 motherboard that MSI made. So they're probably hoping to continue that success with the B450 Tomahawk. Right now, the B350 version of the Tomahawk is selling for $100 US. So this probably won't come in at that price. It'll be probably be a little bit above that, but hopefully it will settle in at the $100 price point before too long. And I imagine a lot of you guys are very interested in the VRM configuration of this board. And I can tell you that it is using a two plus four phase VRM. So pretty skinny there on the power delivery. Uh, you wouldn't want to overclock any Ryzen 7 CPUs on this board, but I imagine you won't have any problems overclocking uh, the Ryzen 5 models like the 26 and the 2600X. Not the need to overclock the 2600X, but if you were going to to 4.2 gigahertz or whatever, this board should be able to do that. But of course, that's something we will look into when we can test it out in about a week's time. And for this particular model, MSI has put uh, passive heat sinks on both the SOC VRM and the CPU V core VRM. And they're decent sized heat sinks and they look quite impressive. I'll get some B roll shots of those. But again, we'll see what temps they run at in the not too distant future. We have a pair of PCIe times 16 slots, though the second slot is, of course, only wired for four times bandwidth. And it looks like just a single M.2 port. For the audio and networking, we have pretty basic solutions. Both are Realtek uh, codec and controller there. So yeah, it's probably suitable for this type of board. Round on the IO panel, there's plenty of USB 3 ports and we do have a type C port as well. So that's good to see there. And you also get all six SATA ports though. Two of them have been sort of hidden down the bottom here. It would have been nice if they were on a 90 degree angle with the rest of them, but whatever. And MSI are also sending along the micro ATX version called the Mortar. So we'll be getting that as well for our day one coverage. So that's nice. So there'll be two MSI motherboards, the Tomahawk and the Mortar. So yeah, there's our brief look at the board. Uh, not much in the package, pretty basic stuff, but for the money, I think it's probably going to end up being a pretty decent motherboard. And hopefully we get some decent overclocks out of those six core Ryzen CPUs. Okay, I'll just set that off to the side for the moment. And we'll move this box out of the way by opening it up and seeing what's inside. We'll do the old fashioned dump everything out of the box. That was a few light stands with rather expensive lights on them. Never mind. Okay, what we have here are two more B450 motherboards of the ASRock variety. We have a cute little one here which we'll look at in a moment. And then something that's probably similar to MSI's B450 Tomahawk, and that is ASRock's B450 Gaming K4. The K4 series is always quite good, quite good value for money. And the sort of standard stuff in the package, CD, manual, quick start guide, IO shield, couple of SATA cables and some M.2 screws. Pretty typical stuff for these entry level boards. 
or probably mid range is a better way to describe these. Entry level would be sort of your A320s. You know what I mean. So we have sort of a black gray theme, similar to the, the Tomahawk that we just looked at. It's a lighter board, it's a bit more, a bit narrower. So a similar IO configuration on this board. We still get an eight pin power input there for the CPU. Uh, similar SATA port configuration, though the layout is a little bit different. Uh, same deal with the PCI Express Time 16 slots. The primary slot is wired for Time 16 bandwidth. The second slot is four times four bandwidth. And then we have four times one slots, which you can use for things like sound cards and upgraded networking and whatever else may use those connectors. Then we have a six plus three phase VRM. And it's possibly gonna disappoint a few of you guys, not surprise others, that it is a three phase VRM with a doubler. So, I'm not sure how well that's going to work, whether it's going to be better or worse than what we see on the MSI Tomahawk. That's something we'll have to look into, but you're definitely not going to be overclocking, again, Ryzen 7 CPUs on this board. It'll be for your Ryzen 5, which again, really does make sense because if you're spending $300-ish on your CPU, you're not going to be cheaping out and spending $100 on your motherboard. So the fact that these boards can really only heavily overclock the sort of the 65 watt models shouldn't really be a problem. Then we have the little mini ITX version, the gaming ITX AC. And as you would expect, we have a very small motherboard. Pretty much the standard package that we've seen so far from the other two boards, but you do get a pair of antenna for this one for the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth support. And the IO shield has got a little design on it, so it's a bit fancier than the, uh, the ATX version. Okay, so tucked away in the back of the board, we find the one and only M.2 slot. And uh, it's a good place to sort of put it there on the back of the board. The only downside is in some cases, it means you have to pull the whole motherboard out just to get to the M.2 slot, your SSD. So that can be annoying, but still it makes sense on these boards because it frees up a lot of room on the front side of the board and you just get a better layout. The SATA ports, for example, there's four of them there tucked away nicely here all together. We get a decent heat sink, which should do an okay job. Again, you're not gonna be chucking an eight core CPU on this and overclocking the hell out of it. That's not gonna go well, because again, we do have the same uh, six phases, but it's really just a three phase VRM. So not gonna be, uh, yeah, again, overclocking the eight core parts on this board, but that probably shouldn't surprise too many of you. Another cool thing about this board is you do get Intel Gigabit LAN, not the Realtek, and you also get the Intel uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, so. That's a nice little combo there for this little entry level, or I keep saying entry level, I need to say budget for this budget B450 mini ITX motherboard. Well done. Cute little heat sink there on the B450 chipset. But uh, yeah, overall good looking board this one. Keen to try it out and see what it can do. And we'll do that uh, in the not too distant future. Okay, what do we got? We got a little box hiding around here. And we got this one here, let's get. Let's get this out of the way, shall we? See what's in here. Oh, I hate bubble wrap. <sighs> Finally got it out. What do we have here? It is, oh, we saw this at Computex. It's the Deep Cool Castle all-in-one liquid cooler. This thing actually looks really impressive. So the new Castle series is available in 240 millimeter or 280 millimeter variants. And it looks like we have the 240 millimeter version here. It might pay to send your products in actual boxes so the box doesn't get so beaten up. Anyway, and it's better for unboxing boxes. So in this box here, we get all the mounting hardware and this does support AM4 and all the latest Intel platforms. Actually, I believe this also supports the TR4 socket. Uh, it's supposed to have a pretty large base plate on this cooler, so it gives good coverage on the TR4 socket. Um, it doesn't look exceptionally large, but they are advertising it to uh, offer full TR4 coverage, so yeah, that's something to look into and check out. Obviously, we've got like the uh, reservoir and the pump housing here is quite large, and it has a mirror finish on top, which has some interesting, or well, provides some interesting effects via the RGB LEDs that are embedded in it. RGB, of course. And also included in the package to whack on your radiator are a pair of their hydro bearing fans. And these guys are, of course, RGB lit as well. So they've got separate RGB connectors that'll go into a controller that will be in that other box that we looked at a moment ago. 
some nice sleeved cables or hoses that run from the radiator to the block and they're crimped off nicely. They seem quite flexible. Looking at it like this doesn't really do it justice, but I will plug this in and I'll add some B-roll to this video so you can get a good look at what it actually looks like. And then hopefully in the not too distant future, I can feature this in a build and we can see how well it actually works. And just quickly for those of you that were wondering that love your RGB goodness, all the RGB lighting for the castle is addressable. So you can do that on uh, the ASUS Aura Sync. It works on, I believe, MSI Mystic lighting, the ASRock stuff. So will work, should work on your motherboard. But yeah, that's pretty much gonna do it for this one. I can't tell you too much more about it without plugging in and seeing how the installation process goes and performance and all that sort of stuff. Uh, price wise, that's probably something I can talk about. Uh, I don't know US availability or pricing. It doesn't appear to be available in the US. So if someone in the US knows of somewhere we can buy it, let me know. I'll put that in the description below. But right now it is $170 Australian, which is up there, but it's not outrageous. So yeah, that's pretty much what you can expect to pay for the higher end 240 millimeter all-in-one liquid coolers. But yeah, I'll give it a go and let you guys know how good it is. All right, let's get this little box out of the way. See what it has to offer. You ready? What do we got? Why do I have to try and break everything? Okay, interesting. Well, it looks like we have a pair of passive heat sinks from Arctic. Looks like one's for your Intel CPUs and then one's for AMD Ryzen, AM4. Uh, well, we'll take, look, take a look at these guys. I don't know what to expect here. Okay, so what we have here is a big old chunk of aluminium, basically. It looks like it's anodized. Oh, it's taken a bit of a ding in the corner there, which is a bit annoying. But anyway, it'll still work. Yeah, they were pretty tightly packaged in that box. That looks like someone's probably used the box as a football. There's the base of it. There's all your fins. And so this is designed to work on 40... 47 watt is the maximum TDP that they're rated for and that'd be full passive mode so uh, pretty poor airflow that I'd be expecting for that so if you had if you're sort of pushing a fair bit of air across this it would work on much higher rated CPUs but if you're using it in a yeah, full passive design which I suppose is what it's intended for 47 watts is the maximum uh, amount of heat you can hope to disperse with this efficiently. It weighs half a kilogram, 508 grams. And yeah, it's quite big, so I don't know how compatibility goes. But anyway, I'm definitely going to try this out. And I'm particularly interested in the AM4 version. So this one doesn't seem like it's any bigger, though oops, the base is slightly larger. So that probably makes it slightly heavier. Yeah, you can see there that the, the base there is a bit a large chunk there of aluminium and it looks like you can orient this thing either that away or that away in your case looking at the mounts on the bottom there so that's kind of handy depending on which way the air is flowing in the case you can you can turn it around the fact that it is square makes that relatively easy to do we have some pre-applied thermal paste that i'm trying very hard not to touch normally i do touch that kind of stuff and this one doesn't have any real dings in it so that's kind of nice it was just the intel one that got beat up in transit yeah, very similar sort of thing. Be interesting to see how this goes on something like the Ryzen 3 2200G. I just quickly checked on my phone. I jumped over to the Arctic website and these things are selling for just $13 US each. So that's a fair chunk of aluminium there for $13. I mean, the mounting stuff's pretty basic, but that's all you need. Yeah, $13 for that. And uh, it's probably better than the Intel box cooler. I don't know, we'll find out in time. Okay, and we're now down to the last box. Actually, no, there is a package on top of it. So we'll check that out. Just quickly, this one is from a viewer, uh, Bart, Little Looney, A Little Looney, I think is the nickname on that one. But yeah, thank you, Bart. I'm not sure what you've sent me, but it's come all the way from the US. So yeah, we'll have a look at what's in here. Ah, I do recall someone, Bart evidently, saying they wanted to send me a flexible PCI Express riser cable to benchmark and see what the latency is like on it, how well it works. Let's have a look at this thing. I've got one of these laying around somewhere that was quite expensive. So I think this one is meant to be quite affordable. 
easy do-it-yourself PCI Express flexible high-speed riser cable 25 centimeters long. Okay. Well, it looks very similar to the thermal tape ones that aren't any good, but apparently this one is meant to be pretty good. Now, I should uh, say that it was the original thermal tape ones that weren't very good. Apparently thermal tape did end up fixing that, but they didn't send it to me to test out. So I don't know. I have, I bought this one for 120 Australian dollars. This is, I think the Leanne Lee version. I can't recall. It was about two years ago now when I bought it. As you can see, I'm not using it anymore, uh, but this worked perfectly fine. No dramas at all. Uh, but yeah, this one, I mean, it looks pretty good. So anyway, I'll give that a go and I'll let you know how it compares to the Lan Lee one. I might try and get a couple of other riser cables and do a, a riser cable roundup. So that could be something fun to do in the near future. Okay, now I am down to the very last box. You know what I've been missing this episode? Random Asian drinks. We'll have to tee that up again for the next episode of Unboxing Boxes. That was a bit of fun and it sort of broke up the, uh, the products being unboxed. Okay, so this is a heavy box sent from Logitech. Well, it says Logitech on it, so I'm just going to assume that it was sent by Logitech. Okay, we've got some things in plastic bags. Two of them look like keyboards. It's been a while since we've checked out a keyboard and unboxing boxes. Mega Blast. Ooh, that sounds pretty cool. Maybe we'll check out the Mega Blast first. Let's do that. Alright. So this is from UE, and UE makes some of the coolest Bluetooth speakers that I've checked out. Really good stuff. And this one is big and heavy, and it's called the Mega Blast, so that can only mean one thing. It's really loud. Let's find out. Pretty funky looking package design there. Once you take that thing off, and here we go. Okay, looks like the boom, but bigger. Whoa, it's very heavy. Also included in the package is a really cool slimline micro USB, I assume charging cable. Yes, charging cable, here's the charger. So it's a 12 volt, one and a half amp or nine volt, two amp charger. One of the two. So that's what you get in the package. You get your charger, your charging cable, and the speaker itself. And I have the black version. I Usually these things come in a whole heap of colors, but I've got the black one this time. And we've also got an accessory that has been included. And this is like a little charging dock, it looks like, based on the picture. So the UE Mega Blast isn't a budget speaker. It's about 250 US or 380 Australian. So very high end, uh, but it does have something like 16 hours of playback and a whole heap of drivers in it, but we'll get to that in a minute. I'll just have a quick look at this dock that we have here. Right, so in the bottom here, we have this little screw and normally when you undo that, well, the point of that is you can remove this little rubber washer and then you can access the charging port at the bottom. Plug the cable in like so, and then this is in the wall, and it charges your speaker up. Or you can leave this in place without actually having to remove it ever. If I can find out how it goes back in. Done. You can put this screw in, and this one is different because it has a little gold contact in the middle. And that works when you sit it on the charging pad. So that's pretty simple. You just sit it. It's pretty easy to land roughly in the middle, sits on there. And then your cable for your charger will plug into this. So they can put that on your desk, charge your speaker, take it off. It's mobile back on the charger. So that's a nice little accessory. I don't know how much that actually costs. So I'll have to find out and put that in the video description, but I do like that accessory. Makes it a bit more convenient. Then we have the speaker itself. And as you can see, it is a big sucker. Let's see if it's got any charge in it at the moment. Indeed it does. Hi there. Please download the Ultimate Ears app on your mobile device to set up your speaker. 
Okay, thank you. I will do that shortly. <laughs> So a good 360 degree sound. So you can hear. It's really nice. Wonder how loud it goes. Well, that sounds very nice indeed. Very, very nice. And it is IP67 uh, waterproof and dustproof, so you can take it outside. It's designed to be used by the pool or take it wherever you go outside and it should be able to survive the elements quite well. You can even submerge it in liquid. It'll go one meter down for up to 30 minutes without dying. So that's handy if you wanna listen to it underwater. Now what you were hearing just a moment ago are the two 25 millimeter tweeters it also has two 55 millimeter active drivers and then it has two 85 millimeter by 50 millimeter uh, passive radiators so yeah combine all those things together and you have yourself a pretty impressive bluetooth speaker anyway for any of you interested i'll have a link in the video description so you can check it out and see if it's worth buying possibly my new favorite bluetooth speaker that all right, and we have some keyboards. It's, like I said, it's been quite some time since we've had some uh, keyboards on unboxing boxes. They used to be a, a staple of the series, and it's been a while. All right, we'll skip over the gaming keyboard for a moment, and we will look at the Craft, the Logitech Craft, because this keyboard is a bit different, a bit interesting. It's designed for your creative types or your professionals that use sort of the Adobe suite of software. And it's all because of the creative input dial. And we'll get to that in a moment and check it out. But yeah, it's quite different you don't find this sort of thing on a lot of keyboards so i suppose we should probably get in and have a look uh for those of you wondering it's 180 dollars us or 280 dollars australian so it's not a cheap keyboard by any means but they are targeting as i said the professional types with it oh it's very slim it takes advantage of logitech's unifying wi-fi technology see this little dongle here you can plug that into pretty much any device with usb otherwise it also supports bluetooth which is a nifty little addition this top bit here is aluminium i can tell because it's freezing in this room because this room's cold and the dial also seems to be aluminium so that's very nice and this is very cool to charge the keyboard you can use a type c connector very nice indeed of course, it is Type A at this end, but you could get a Type C to Type C cable, I suppose, if you wanted to. Right, in the top left corner here, we can find the creative input dial, which can be clicked and it can be rotated left or right. And it has a very notchy feel to it, an audible sound. Logitech software does offer integration for the Adobe suite. So you've got Photoshop, Illustrator, Premiere, uh, InDesign, and then other software like Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and then a few other things like QuickTime, Safari, Google Chrome, and Spotify. So there's plenty of applications that you can use this knob to control and speed up your workflow. Again, it is meant for professionals and creative types but casual users can also take advantage of this keyboard and it will help you switching between apps quicker or changing the volume up or down in spotify all kinds of things like that there's many purposes of the creative dial beyond that though you just get a low profile keyboard it's uh, got a bit of a clicky feel to it sort of a step up from what you would find on a laptop i suppose uh, there's no feet, but the back is slightly raised, so it's not a not a seriously aggressive angle of attack, but still comfortable enough. Because it is so thin, it sits very flat, flatly, flattish. It's very flat on your desk. 
Uh, because of that, it's, I find it very ergonomic. You don't need, you know, your big sort of wrist rest that the gaming keyboards often need with those really raised keys. And often they're a bit chunkier as well, those uh, Cherry MX switches and things like that. But yeah, very, very slim line and very comfortable to use. I actually really like the feel of it. So I'm keen to give that a go later on. And finally, a gaming focused keyboard. There's not many of those about. And this one uses the Roma G tactile switches, the G512 Carbon. So, pretty swisho looking keyboard. It looks, again, it looks pretty compact actually. I should also note that the keys aren't backlit on this particular model, whereas they are on this one. And it's a gaming keyboard. You know it's RGB backlit. Of course it is. Already I can tell you it's a very similar design to the other uh, Logitech RGB keyboards that we've looked at before. A pair of Type-A USB ports, so that means it will have pass-through, and there is the port for pass-through, so you can plug your mouse into your keyboard or flash media, whatever it is that you want to use. The back of the keyboard is pretty uh, typical of what we've seen before. There's some cable routing here for your mouse. And then you've got some feet, single stage feet, so you can flip them up, quite a nice angle. Again though, you will, I, I would personally want to use this with a wrist rest, it just sits up a bit too high for me to use like this for long periods of time, my, my hands would get a bit sore. The G512 is available with a few different uh, switch options, so you've got the Roma G Tactile, which I have here, there's also the Roma G uh, Linear switches, and then you've just got the GX Blue switch as well, so there's a few options there. Let's see what happens when we plug this in. By default, we get the nice rainbow effect, but of course, using the Logitech software, you can configure many different zones of lighting and effects and all that kind of stuff that you would expect to see. And then on top here, protecting the keyboard, we have some brushed aluminium. It's probably aircraft grade aluminium, no doubt, because, you know, coat can aluminium just won't cut it here. But uh, no, it's, it's quite, it's a few mil thick, it feels quite good, gives it a bit of strength, it takes, there's very little flex in this keyboard, it's very solid, nice and durable. So yeah, really keen to give this one a go as well. I'll probably play with the craft first because this is just very unique looking and I think I'll really enjoy that one with Premiere. But anyway, so it looks like we've done pretty well out of this episode of Unboxing Box. I've got myself a new Bluetooth speaker, might be my new favourite Bluetooth speaker. Got a new gaming keyboard, got a potentially new favorite keyboard, not sure about that one yet. And then of course, the B450 motherboards. And I really like the Mini ITX model here. And I have to say the uh, MSI Tomahawk looks really good as well. And I'm interested to see how that four phase VRM goes with the Ryzen 5 2600X. So that should be good, hopefully. Won't be too long, I think it's about a week and a half before you'll see any benchmarking with these motherboards on the channel. But considering how long you've waited, so what's another week and a half? But anyway, that is going to do it for this episode of Unboxing Boxes. Hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you on the channel again soon for more content because we have another video tomorrow, the day after, the day after that. I think we have a video planned pretty much every day for the next four weeks, so we're gonna be busy. But anyway, I should get back to it, and yeah, again, hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.